Hi there, it's tea at the Ritz in the garden. I thought we'd go outside today to have our drink and get together and because uh, the sun is shining, it's lovely and warm. And um, I know from what you've been uh, showing on Super Troopers, all the wonderful pictures, that you're, most of you, very keen on gardening and you love gardens. So what better opportunity than to, uh, to share some thoughts and ideas about what gardening means to, uh, to us in our lives. Lives. That's what I want to talk to you about, what it's meant to me, some of the joys, some of the heartaches and um, and why I've got this little uh, little garden here in the way that I've got it. I'm going to move out of the way so that you can see it. Um, let me just sit back slightly. So that's my garden. It's quite small. Um, I decided to future-proof it uh, last year. I'll tell you a little bit about that later. But it's given me enormous pleasure during lockdown, no question. I feel so sorry for people who've had no access to outside space, private outside space, um, during the uh, the last few weeks. It must have been an absolute nightmare. I've lived in flats on first floor. On the first floor, I did so just after I got divorced. And I also did so in one of the flats that I bought in London. It was a big mistake and I regretted it. Uh, so I, I made sure that the next time I would have some outside space. Uh, so that's why I bought this place. So um, how was your weekend? Mine was lovely. I had a lovely break. I had a real rest, uh, enjoyed myself, saw a good film, French one, and um, it was really nice. But uh, we're going into uh, a different phase in terms of lockdown, and I'm not feeling particularly confident about that. I'm going to leave three to four weeks, I think, before I see what is actually happening with this virus, which I don't feel is at all under control. Um, so uh, the restrictions are easing, um, but I'm not going to start living my life particularly differently, certainly for the next three to four weeks. Uh, I shall keep shopping, as I have been doing all the way through, but doing so very, very carefully. Um, anyway, that's me. Uh, maybe some of you are making different decisions, but you may live in different parts of the, of the country or the world where circumstances are different for you. Uh, but that's how I'm approaching it. Um, we also, uh, at Look Fabulous Forever, we've sort of come back to work properly. Um, we have been working all the way through, but we've sort of hunkered down a bit, made some changes. Um, we've been working from home and we will still continue to work from home, but uh, we're kind of revving it up into much more normal activity. And one of the things that we've always get, we always get terribly excited about because it's a big moment for us is when we launch a new product. Uh, it's often been a long time in the coming and the uh, development. And that's certainly true of our latest product, which we launched yesterday. So really excited about it. And that's our Night Revive eye cream. Now, we produced an eye cream because you asked us to, you know, you said, I love to use an eye cream and uh, I don't know why you haven't got one in the range. So we did our usual, uh, you know, due diligence and testing. It has got wonderful hyaluronic acid in it. It is full of all the vitamins that you would expect it to be full of, you know, A, C, E uh, and uh, some of the B vitamins. And it is designed to reduce puffiness, reduce dark circles uh, do a little bit of lifting here if you've got loose skin. You basically apply it over your whole eye area, being careful not to get it actually in your eyes, and then around here uh, again to reduce the appearance of fine lines and wrinkles and uh, all those things that we don't like very much. So I do hope you'll have a look at that and uh, see if you think it would be appropriate for you if you like to have an eye cream. Um, so Back to gardens and gardening. Uh, what I want to do really is to share with you some of my thoughts and feelings about uh, about gardening. It's something I've come to very late in my life. I certainly haven't been a gardener all my life, although gardens have been important to me uh, since I was a child really. When I was born in the uh, late 40s, 1947, um, I had this, <laughs> we had this really peculiar circumstance at home in lots of ways. During the war, my grandfather had built uh, two houses, they were semi-detached, um, on a very large plot of land. And uh, they were ready for the post-war period when my father returned from six years uh, abroad um, in the war. 
and uh, my grandparents moved into one house and my mum and dad moved into the other house but the gardens were never separated so it was probably about two or three acres it was a big plot um, so the two houses stood on this plot and with one massive garden and my dad uh, in his sort of post-war desire to protect us all decided that he would turn it into basically a massive allotment almost like a small holding so he had two greenhouses built uh, he kept pigs so he had pig styes but he turned all of the rest of this land this this um, this piece piece of land that they had into a massive massive garden to produce food so when i was a child we ate everything from that garden that could be grown and my dad grew everything he could he grew sweet corn he grew asparagus raspberries strawberries and we also had and they must have been there originally quite a lot of trees so there were plum trees green gauge trees apple trees pear trees a walnut a huge walnut tree so it was absolutely like a cornucopia um, when I was growing up and the food was you know dad would go out and cut a cabbage or dig up some onions or uh, potatoes or whatever we needed and uh, you know I don't know 20 minutes later they'd be on our plates so uh, he also didn't use pesticides so it was almost like organic um, it was incredible and that's what I ate as a child so gardens to me certainly for a long time represented food and um, that's what you use the land for, if you like. Uh, when I first got married, um, I suppose in my 20s and 30s, uh, we would have a patch of lawn, uh, quite a boring patch of lawn, I have to say, and a few odd shrubs dotted around the edge. I wasn't interested at all. My husband would cut the grass, and uh, as far as I was concerned, the outside space we had were for the children to play and for me to lie in, in the sun uh, when it was hot. Um, and that really continued through uh, for a long time. The first time I got interested in actually growing something uh, was when I was doing my degree. I was in my 30s. I was doing my degree at... Um, uh, at university I'd gone back for four years the kids were small they were um, they were both at school and I realized that the sort of uh, patio that we had uh, in this uh, quite reasonable sized garden would look a lot better if it had some pots on it so I started to go and buy uh, bedding plants knowing absolutely nothing about it but I bought things like petunias and pelagoniums and all those things that you do buy and I started to pot them up and the pleasure the pleasure that I got out of those pots was absolutely unbelievable they were like a, they were like a gift I gave to myself in the summer after I'd worked hard and done my exams so there was this particular garden center that I loved in in Woburn Woburn in Bedfordshire which I could drive to and it was a big garden center and I got so much pleasure out of going there and pottering around looking at the plants trying to learn some of their names and educate myself about something I was totally ignorant of but I would just buy bedding plants and I would bring them back and pot them up and uh, I loved them one year I must tell you this story oh my goodness um, I did I did all that my uh, my ex-husband uh, then husband was uh, his gardening was entirely about uh, <laughs> this is going to sound really unkind but it was entirely about killing things so he would cut the grass he would chop back the shrubs um, he would uh, weed you know it was about pulling things out uh, cutting things and uh, um, pruning things let's put it that way he didn't grow anything uh, so I tried a little bit anyway one time I went and bought uh, a lot of beautiful bedding plants and I, you know, dotted them around, put them into pots, made a lovely display. Can you imagine what it was like? And uh, I started watering them with a watering can. And uh, the second or third night that I'd been was watering the plants, he came home from work and he was watching me and he said, you're not watering those with that watering can, are you? Is obviously I was. Anyway, it was, uh, he'd been using it full of weed killer and he'd left some in the bottom and uh, I 
bought all these bedding plants and they all died, every single one. Um, if I tell you that the air was blue, um, well, that would be an understatement. I found it hard to forgive, to be honest with you. Anyway, uh, things moved on. And um, the next time that I had a challenge in terms of gardening was uh, when I bought a totally derelict, completely run down ruin in France. Um, it was post-divorce. It was in the 1990s. I went to France to do a, a photographic holiday and I fell in love with this particular region which is called the Drôme Provence. It's uh, around the area of Valence, Montélimar. Uh, it's slightly north of Orange if you know that place. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful spot. Mind you, most of France is beautiful. But I did fall in love with it and I decided to buy, um, having in inherited some money from my parents, um, something that I could uh, that use as a holiday home. So uh, I was very fortunate to, to find on six acres of land this totally derelict cottage uh, with no running water. It did have electricity but it didn't have any uh, capacity for bathrooms and toilets and things like that so it's a huge risk but it cost me £20,000 and I decided that I would buy it and uh, and and see what I could do. So I did. Uh, I bought it. I then found a wonderful builder, a really truly amazing guy, who uh, who gave me a quote for pulling down the uh, the ruined cottage and rebuilding it, finding water and so on and so forth. And over a period of about two years, that's what uh, I did. Now, of course, I had all this land. It's uh, terraced, so you come in at, at the top where the road is, you come down the drive and then you've got a flat open bit which is where the house is and then it's terraced down again and there's an, there's an, there's another level which is where the pool is and then it terraces down again and there's a vast area that is actually wilderness. Um, what I've done over the years is to try and tame that landscape with some varying degrees of success, mostly failure and that's where the heartache comes in. When the place was built, they, uh, the topsoil was more or less destroyed. So in, I was left with uh, land that had been scraped of all the good, goodness, really. So I've been battling that ever since. I should have followed. I, I read a brilliant book by Elizabeth Spender, which is called A Garden in Provence. And she did something very similar to me only in the 1950s and 60s. But what she did, she grew a kind of vetch on the ground, on the land first, and then had it all ploughed into the land to enrich the soil so that she put nutrients into the soil first before she tried to create her garden. I didn't do that, so I've been battling that problem ever since. I wanted to put lots of trees in, so I have put trees in, um, some silver birch, one of which has survived, um, some other more native trees to down there, and an olive tree and, uh, and various other bits and pieces, uh, lilac bushes and so on. Some of them have survived, many of them have not. The problem is that the uh, the weather can be minus 10 to 15 in the winter and in the summer it can get up to, um, to 40 uh, degrees. It's extremely hot so you have these huge, huge ranges of temperature and frankly most of the things that I put in with great hope and with lots of enthusiasm they just can't cope with it so I have tried to do native stuff obviously lavender does reasonably well roses do do quite well as long as they've got some kind of uh, protection um, I put in oleander um, which worked extremely well for um, about three or four years and then one year I went down there and they were all dead there's a bit of lawn which is uh, very rough and very ready. It takes me about two or three hours to cut. I cut it myself pushing a lawnmower. It is a, it is a petrol lawnmower but it's hard work and it's often very hot. So that garden has given me uh, a lot of pain, some pleasure. Uh, I mean it's a glorious, glorious spot and the view is tremendous. So now I restrict myself almost entirely to 
pots which again I do when I get down there and it's very similar to what I did when uh, when I was doing my exams uh, back in the 1980s. I just go out, buy bedding, I put them into pots all the way around the house, I water them practically every day and they die when I leave. Um, but that's as much as I can can bear to do. Um, and now it brings me to my little plot uh, of heaven in, in Wimbledon. Um, I moved in here. This was a property that I bought at auction. The garden was uh, very dilapidated, very run down and full of um, sort of old stuff that uh, wasn't doing very well. Uh, so I decided to have to have it done but I made a huge mistake I put in things that were too big for the for the space um, a wisteria for instance that just grew and grew and grew and was beautiful but it was it was taking over the entire garden and it didn't have the right support um, and various other things that just didn't work and then the back of it everything was falling down the gate this leads on to a to, to a small path. Um, I'm lucky because I'm in the middle of uh, the gardens behind me so there's a road down there and a road down there and their gardens meet where I am so I can't see any houses from where I am which is amazing and um, so actually you can you can just see a house back uh, over there but nothing overlooks the garden. Anyway last year I decided that my garden had become uh, overgrown and impossible for me to actually manage on my own. Uh, and it didn't look very nice either. So I just thought I'm going to future proof it. When I get older, I'm going to want a space that I can manage myself with plants that I can get pleasure from and, uh, and you know, do whatever I want with uh, in the way that um, needs to be done. So I asked a friend who happens to design gardens if she'd come around and have a look and she drew up a, a lovely plan, very simple, and I got a couple of guys in to do the hard landscaping and we decided to have walls topped with um, cedar panels so that the that basically we were creating the, the walls of the room that my garden has become. I do think of it as an outside room. Um, and then we did, we did the, uh, she designed the, the paving. You can see that I've got an area just outside which is rectangular then I've got a circular bit in the middle and then another rectangular bit at the end and I wanted deep enough beds so that I could have low stuff and middle medium height stuff and then high stuff like the delphiniums and uh, and so on and uh, uh, so she designed it for me and then I planted it up uh, this is the first, this is my second year of the garden so I'm learning all about it and what it uh, what it likes what it needs half the garden is in sun half the garden is in shade a lot of the time and uh, so we you know the plants have to uh, to work with that but coming back to lockdown the pleasure that this garden has given me has been immense um, I wasn't able to get any bedding this year until last week when although the garden centers opened I couldn't bear the queues so I um, Anna let me know that there was a, a market stall in um, something called a place called Northcote Road which is about 10 minutes drive from here so I went over there and uh, very quickly very safely managed to buy two big trays of pelagoniums and verbena and I planted those to give some bright spots of colour. So lots of pleasure. And um, I guess, uh, as I said, for me, gardens started as a child to be about food. And then they became things that I could perhaps uh, get a um, participate in in a safe way, just with pots. Then they became a huge challenge. It became a huge challenge for me in France to try and wrest some kind of colour and... Uh, and greenery out of what is basically um, quite quite a well quite a challenging uh, uh, parcel of land, if you like. And uh, and now I've just come to terms with over twenty years with the house in France of what is possible and what's absolutely not possible. And I've gone back to pots again. And then here, I hope that this is a future-proof garden that in ten years' time, when I'm eighty-two. Um, and perhaps 10 years after that, when I'm 92, I hope to still be living here and that uh, the garden is something that I can manage um, and which continues to give me pleasure. Um, I want to finish with a poem, uh, which actually is a little bit about the pleasure and the pain of gardening. Um, 
or not not really gardening, a, a bit of, um, it's called Blackberry Picking, it's by Seamus Heaney, it's a beautiful poem. Um, and uh, down in France we have bramble, you know, lots of brambles around, and uh, one year we uh, we were there, I was there, the time when the, when the blackberries were ripe, and I picked a whole load, and I turned it into jam, I mean, I made one and a half jars, <laughs> don't think that I had a store cupboard full for the winter, but it was a huge pleasure, but uh, this, is a, this is a lovely poem that I want to end with. So late August, given heavy rain and sun, for a full week the blackberries would ripen. At first just one, a glossy purple clot, among others, red, green, hard as a knot. You ate that first one and its flesh was sweet, like thickened wine. Summer's blood was in it, leaving stains upon the tongue and lust for picking. Then red ones inked up. And that hunger sent us out with milk cans, pea tins, jam pots, where briars scratched and wet grass bleached our boots. Round hayfields, cornfields and potato drills we trekked and picked until the cans were full, until the tinkling bottom had been covered with green ones, and on top big dark blobs turned, burned, like a plate of eyes. Our hands were peppered with thorn pricks, our palms sticky as bluebeards. We hoarded the fresh berries in the byre, but when the bath was filled, we found a fur, a rat grey fungus glutting on our catch. The juice was stinking too. Once off the bush, the fruit fermented. The sweet flesh would turn sour. I always felt like crying. It wasn't fair that all the lovely canful smelt of rot each year I hoped they'd keep, knew they would not. So that's some of the pleasures of, uh, of having the lovely ripe fruit, but having too much of it in one go, which I'm sure happens to a lot of people who have allotments, you know, and they start to have to give stuff away because they get a bumper crop and they can't eat it all. Um, but anyway, that's a lovely poem. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, I will very much look forward to seeing you on Friday. Uh, for another tea at the Ritz. See you then. Bye-bye.